Hey everyone, this is Three Questions with Jan Iwasi. There we got the music, ready to go. Jan, it is so good to have you on the podcast. I'm excited to sit down and talk with you. We had some technical difficulties getting on, mm -hmm. but uh, we're both really avid learners. So I am uh, really excited to sit down and talk to you. And we actually met in Hawaii um, several years ago. Yes. And uh, I remember how welcoming you were there too. And it's actually, um, you sent me your new book. It's called Educating with Aloha. And we're going to actually have a longer podcast talking about that. But Jan, you are just retired in 2018. Uh, this is being broadcast in 2022. And so when you think about your career, um, all the, the students that you've had an impact on, all the teachers you connected with, who is a teacher that you think of, whether it was as a student, as a colleague that really inspired you and why? You know, that was, uh, that's a, a hard question because I don't think I would have become an, uh, a teacher or an educator if I didn't have a lot of people who had um, encouraged me along the way. And um, I would have to say that it would be my kindergarten teacher and Miss Mizukami. And, you know, we were in a brand new school in our neighborhood. And I didn't realize at the time how special that actually was to be in a brand new school. Um, but, you know, in those days, um, back in the 1950s, uh, we didn't go to preschool, you know? So that was our first experience with school. And it was just such a special place for me, um, meeting new people, new friends, because we lived in a small um, community. But, um, you know, we didn't really have an opportunity to to see the pe the kids on the others, you know, in, in the entire sure. area. So, um, but just the things that we did, just she just made me love school. And that's when I actually decided that I wanted to become a teacher just like her. And I think, um, you know, one of the reasons why I went into early childhood education was because of my experiences in the lower grades and in that at that time kindergarten was not academic right. um we didn't start learning to read until kin until first grade and um you know it was the painting the blocks the house corner the reading you know reading books to us as we lay in our sleeping bags getting ready for our nap so mm -hmm. it was just a really really wonderful experience and i knew that that was just what i wanted to do when i and that, grew that up uh, that that's so amazing and like we're gonna get a little applause to your kindergarten <laughs> teacher for inspiring you and you know you're having a full career and just imagining how many you know students would say the same thing about you and the one thing that really resonated with me and that you said i'm curious your thoughts is you said it wasn't as academic and i actually still think it shouldn't be as academic to be honest with you i think we're rushing kids um, to be adults and not letting kids be kids in some ways. And it's something I'm very guarded with, with my own, uh, children. Like, of course we want them to do well academically, but we want them to enjoy childhood. And I think a lot of times, um, the adults are pushing, um, you know, kind of our, our aspirations for ourselves onto our kids, not necessarily letting our kids be kids. And I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Is that something that you've seen it throughout your career? Like, is that something you noticed? Because you, you made that comment. Is that do you, do you see that as something better that we're actually for focusing on kids being more academic or is it actually a step back? I think it's a step back, really. Yeah. I think kids do need to be kids. And um, uh, it, it worries me that we're rushing them to to read before they're ready or to write before they're ready. You know, to me, um, the way to get them to want to read and write is to mm. uh, give them the kinds of experiences that I had of being exposed to, you know, to books right. and to have that time to just explore on your own. Um, I think that that's really very important in early childhood education. And, and it does concern me when, um, you know, when I was, I was a principal at elementary school and I was teaching at an elementary school and to see kids come in at such different levels. And yet we have these grade level standards and we're expecting them all to reach the standards right. by the end of the year. And, and that really concerns me. I mean, I remember when I was going to school and um, I think there was a book called teacher by Sylvia Ashton Warner. And, you know, at that time she said, 
you know, there's a there's a period when kids will start learning to read, and it's not necessarily at age five or age six or right. age seven, you know, because they need the time to develop the skills that will make them become readers. So, yeah, I think we are rushing our kids too much. I really yeah. do. There's a there's a movie that is one of my favorites. It's called My Dog Skip. I actually watched it when I was teaching grade four. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And my grade four students said, asked me if we could watch the movie. And I was like, yeah, we can watch this. It was a Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was like bawling in front of my kids because it's, oh. it's, it's a beautiful movie. But there's one mm -hmm. line that I remember in that movie because it's about a boy. <laughs> I'm going to start crying just talking about it. It's about a boy and his dog growing up. And then, mm -hmm. you know, they grow up and, you know, the dog does what a dog does later on in life and mm -hmm. and it was uh the, the line is something to the effect of we spend our whole childhood wishing we can be adults and then we spend our whole adulthood wishing we can go back to being kids and that's oh. something that I, I just always think about that and i'm really guarded that mm -hmm. with that so i appreciate you um sure i actually see <laughs> Like, like I didn't see that movie. I guess I better go watch oh, it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was a little bit, uh -huh. It's pretty. It's pretty sweet. Um. So the second question, and uh -huh. uh, you you mentioned that you were a principal, but when you think uh -huh. of all the administrators that you connect with, whether it's a student, whether it's a colleague, uh -huh. who's an administrator that you think of that really inspired you, and why? Uh -huh. Well, um, when I was working with Head Start, we didn't have um principal or anything. We were all at different locations mm -hmm. around the island. And um, but our supervisor, the person who he was called an education coordinator or something, um, he really did inspire me because he would come in and talk story with the kids and talk story with the parents who were there. And, you know, we always had parents in our classroom because in Head Start, uh, part of our goal is to um, provide parents with the skills that they need to be successful parents of their children. They are their first, their child's first teacher. So we wanted to give them those kinds. So we invited them to our classroom to volunteer. And, um, you know, just seeing their progress over the year. Um, you know, I think it was as much a joy to me to see the parents being able to really interact with kids and and to talk with them so that they could really learn and and then to see them doing that with their own kids. I mean, that was really um, what I really loved about that job. But his name was Miles and he would come in and very, very unassuming, but he would just, he, he made me realize how important it is to have somebody to, um, mentor you and to say, right. hey, you know, you're doing a great job and to give you the encouragement to keep going. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, a lot of ideas that came from our conversations. And um, I never felt that he was watching me to see what I was doing. Rather, he was helping me to grow as a teacher. And I think that's really very important for any supervisor or any principal or any school leader to, to have that relationship so that the people under them will continue to grow and, and be better. Yeah. And I, I think the, you know, some of the best administrators that I've ever worked with, mm -hmm. um, I think what they do really well is, is exactly what you said is help people grow in that job. But I think they inspire them to continue to grow after they leave that job, after they're in that position, right? And I think mm -hmm. that's what great teachers do too. Uh, great yes. teachers develop kids who want to be learners after they leave that classroom, who, you know, kind of start looking and finding their own ways to to make an impact, you know, outside of the classroom after their time. And so I, I, I absolutely love that. So um, I really appreciate you sharing that. And so okay. um, you, you said you retired in 2018. Uh, this is actually being recorded 2021, post in 2022. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at your career yes. and you look back at your very first year, and I know you obviously remember it because you remember your <laughs> kindergarten teacher. So, yeah. like, so you look back at your career and your first year of teaching. So mm -hmm. like, if you could go back and talk to yourself, what advice mm -hmm. would you give to yourself as, at the start of your mm -hmm. career? Mm -hmm. Well, I think every first year teacher thinks they're going to do a terrific job from the beginning. And, you know, it's really different to have your own classroom right. as opposed to student teaching where you have someone there who's guiding you. And even if you have a solo experience, which we were required to do, that 
teacher is your supervisor is still there to to help you and to hmm. uh, mentor you along so when you're on your own uh you know it's a whole different ball game i talk about i mentioned in a blog that i wrote recently that um on the very first day of school um and these are three and four year olds never been in school before so you know when mom drops them off you know they're crying and 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 touching everything well on the first day of school um a little boy went up to the calendar started pulling off all the numbers and i said uh no don't do that as i was consoling a kid who was crying i suddenly heard the scream and this ran over and Eddie had bitten this girl and she was bruising. <laughs> and he looked at me very innocently. He said, I told her not, I told her teacher said not to touch that. And I said, oh my goodness. Okay. Now in those <laughs> days, no telephones in the classroom. Okay. Right. And when the kids got on the bus to go home, my aide and I, we quickly got in our car and we drove down to that girl's house because I wanted to tell the mother, right? I mean, before wow. she saw the girl, I wanted to let her know what had happened. Right. And she was really cool. She, We had already been to her house because we had done home visits. Mm -hmm. So she had kind of trusted us, I guess. And and so I told her, I said, I'm really sorry, but this is what happened today. And the girl came over and she said, let me see. And she looked and she said, ah, you're going to be fine. <laughs> and it just, I tell you, right. I've, Today, right. we would have had to report that, you know, right. and and the parent might be very upset. But in that at that time, she was pretty cool about it. And so I would say I learned a very valuable lesson that day, which was be the first to tell the parent when something happens. Totally, totally. You know, yeah. don't wait for the child to go home and give their version yeah. of what happened. Or anytime there's a problem, you know, be proactive and and take the matter into your own hands and tell them what happened. Don't hide it. And um, I think that carried me very well throughout all my years as a teacher, as well as an administrator. Yeah. And I, and I, and I love that. And that's something actually, you know, I, I and I, I appreciate that you went to the, the parents' house, right? And I don't know mm -hmm. if like all teachers have access to that, but having that conversation, right, in person. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I always said to my staff, never deliver bad information to a parent via an email never because they cannot read your tone they have no idea what's going on yes. like at least get them on a phone call um so they, they know you care about their kid they can hear mm -hmm. how you're talking about them mm -hmm. um but even as a principal i had a rule if a kid was in my office whether it's for a good thing or a bad thing mm -hmm. i always called the parent to say like hey mm -hmm. I, I talked to your child this morning or mm -hmm. you know and like this just just wanted to let you know and they're doing awesome blah 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 mm -hmm. because because I actually, I, it's funny because I was a, you know, I was a principal, uh, but I also have probably my whole life, I have this, like, I don't want to go to the principal's office anxiety. So like, <laughs> it's kind of terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. And so if a kid went home and said, yeah, I was in Mr. Cross's office today, <laughs> have that parent wonder what happened. So I want to make sure that they're, they're not wondering that stuff at all. And yeah. my secretary at the time, her name's Frances Ogurian. I remember her saying this to me because I wasn't a parent at the time. She said, yeah. you know, when you have a kid who's maybe done something wrong, made a mistake, and you call home, understand you could destroy that parent's world, like total uh -huh. world. So just make sure that they know you care about their kid. So just, that is the first thing you have to do. And then and then you can tell them the information, right? So mm -hmm. just make sure to do that. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that advice. And um, <laughs> you know, as as I'm listening, as I'm listening to you, and I hope we get to talk about this a little bit more in our next podcast. Mm -hmm. Um I think, I, you know, you know me that I'm really focused on innovation, but there's a lot of mm -hmm. things I wish we could go back to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, and I appreciate that, I, you know, when I think uh, a lot of things that I really appreciate about education, I think sometimes we've lost and I think it's for, you know, not necessarily for the better. So um, I'm not about always doing the newest thing. I'm, a, I'm about always doing the best thing, whatever, yes. whatever era that came from. So yes. uh, I'm really excited that uh, we got to sit down and talk today we, and we got all the technical stuff. <laughs> sort of though, but, yeah. And anyways, anyone who's listening, I uh, check out Jan's book, Educating with Aloha, and we'll be talking about that more in the next podcast. But Jan, thanks so much for being on. Everyone, thank you so much uh, for listening. Thank you, George. Thanks, Jan. Thank you.